Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Kane, and I'm the Marketing Manager for E&M. Thank you for attending our PLC Programming Best Practices webinar today. After the webinar this morning, we will be, we will be doing a short Q&A. Please type any questions or comments into the Q&A box, the chat box, or you can email us at enmwebinar at enm.com. Now I'd like to introduce your presenter for today's webinar, Bill Hintz. Bill has been working with Siemens Automation Products for 25 years as both an OEM machine designer while at James River Dixie Products, and also with Agilent Technologies as an engineering manager. Bill is currently an E&M Siemens product specialist working with customers to, de to design new applications for Siemens products. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Kelly, and thanks, and welcome, everyone. Um, this, as Kelly mentioned, is the best practices webinar, and what we're going to be doing today is actually using the new beast on the block, which is the Somatic S7-1500 controller. Um, in order to do that, we use actually something called the TIA portal software. So let's talk a little bit about the 1500. Um, those of you that are familiar with the um, Siemens S7 product line, probably already heard of the S7-1200, which has been out for about four years now, um, and also the 300 and 400 series, which are st have been out for some time, and they're still the mainstay of Siemens uh, middle range and upper range automation platforms. They have announced that uh, the these two platforms are still going to be with us into the 2020s, so no worries for anybody that's using those now. This is not going to be replacing those products, but they're going to actually accentuate them. The S7-1500 here we see is going to actually in, be in the performance range of the 300 and 400, and it gives us a couple of new features, including a much faster backplane and so forth. So it actually gives them the opportunity to uh, bring some new features to the market. we take a look at the 1500, um, those of you familiar with the S7-300, it's a similar form factor and uh, kind of the same idea with a um, DIN rail uh, backplane, so it actually creates its own bus as we go. All of these modules here connect together by a little U-shaped connector that fits in the behind them, and as we go along, we add more modules. Um, we create the backplane as we go. So the actual um, DIN rail itself doesn't have any active components in it. Um, the, the bus expands as we go. One of the differences with a 1500, it gives us a much wider um, availability of I.O. modules. Uh, we can get up to 32 modules on the backplane on the uh, 1500. There's a couple of the, the first uh, release processors were the 1511 and the 1513 and also the 1516. They have since the initial release sent out a couple of two new ones, the 1515 and 1518. 1518 is the, the beast of the block. Um, and I think we've got some specs coming up here in a moment. There's also some compact I.O. modules that have been released and some communication processors. Here we go. Um, here we see a kind of a grid showing the different capabilities of the different 1500s, um, all the way from 60 nanoseconds per bit uh, performance all the way down to one nanosecond. So those of you familiar with MIPS, I guess that would be a GIPS, um, a billion operations per second. Don't know what we'd use that for yet, but I'm sure if we find something, we'll be able to do it. Um, this also shows how many interfaces are, are on each processor. We've got the 1515 that's got a second um, IP port. The purple ones are Profibus, so, and then the 1518's actually got three Profinet and then one Profibus port. A front panel on the 1500 actually has got a, a nice little display on it which gives us lots of different capabilities as far as diagnostics. We can log in there, we can see, uh, we can run stop the PLC, we can change IP addresses. A lot of the features that um, used to take a laptop and coming out and uh, programming cable and so forth, uh, now we can actually do right through the front panel. Okay, so having said that, let's talk a little bit about, I wanted to show you one thing before we get into the programming environment, and that is that we've got a couple of things coming up. Uh, there is a TIA portal programming class in San Francisco and another one following that in Irvine that uh, actually is a four-day in-depth um, TIA portal programming class, which we'll be using the 1500. 
We've also got some um, a roadshow coming up in the fall, which will actually be a 10-day 10 10-city 10 roadshow. So look for one in a city near you. Okay, having said all that, let's go ahead and jump into the TIA portal software. I'll bring that in here. And what we're looking at here is called the portal view. The portal view actually gives us a jump off point to actually get into all the different features of the, uh, the TIA portal software. Uh, if I go down here and look at installed software, I've actually got uh, I'm in version 13, which is the latest release. Um, a neat new feature of 13, it actually allows us to check for updates here and if there's any new hardware um, and so forth that can actually be downloaded into our configuration library. You just click that button and it will update for you. I'm going to go ahead and create a new project and we can just go ahead and use the default project 29 I guess. And once I do that it pops me into a screen that shows me all the different things I can do now that a project is open. I can configure a device which is the first thing we're going to do. We could also just jump off and write PLC programs, go off and do a motion controller, uh, drives, HMI screens. And in our case, we're going to hit configure a device. It says show all devices in the project. There's nothing there yet. So we'll go add a new device. And since I have the, um, the TIA professional version, what that gives me is all these different processors that are actually available to me to program. The basic version has the 1200. And the professional gives me all the rest of these. So we can actually program the 300 and 400 in TIA portal now too. We're going to pick the 1500 today, as I mentioned. And here's all the different processors available. And there's two new, new releases here that at the bottom, the F series. These are fail-safe processors. So safety PLCs are now available in the 1500 series. I'm going to pick a middle-of-the-road guy, just a 1500. 1515, double click that, and it'll go ahead and populate my project with a 1500, and then at the same time, it's actually going to jump me off into the project view. And this is really where everything happens in TIA portal. The project view has on the left side, and this is, no matter what we're doing in the portal, we're going to have the same look and feel, which is kind of a nice feature. So no matter whether we're doing an HMI screen or a drive or a uh, PLC, it all looks the same. We can kind of jump around and learn to navigate one of the portal uh, attributes and all of them are fairly similar. So if I look over here on the left, since I'm in the hardware configuration and we added a PLC, it has given me the hardware catalog. And the catalog is going to include things like CPUs, digital in, digital out, I'm going to add a couple of digital I.O. modules. If I just double click on one, and this is a 16 point digital input, it'll put it in the first available slot. I'll give it a digital output as well. Do a 16 of that as well. So now I've got a PLC, a couple of Ethernet Profinet ports on it. We've got a digital input module. And we've got a digital output module. I'm going to go ahead and compile that, make sure everybody's happy. All right, so now that we've actually created a PLC, we'll see underneath here in the project tree, we've got a lot of different um, attributes of that PLC, including one called program blocks. And program blocks are actually where the programming of the PLC happens. And you'll see we have one gimme here. There's an add new block, which if I wanted to add a different type of a block than it's already in there, I could do that here. Or the gimme block is called OB1, or organization block one. Um, that's the traditional PLC scan. So what a PLC typically does is it reads all of its input points out of the input modules. It runs any code that it finds in OB1, which I'll open.
and then it updates all of its output points, and then it does that all over again as fast as it can. Now, it also does a little bit of diagnostics and watchdog timers and all that kind of good stuff in the background to make sure there's no faults or anything else. But uh, generally, OV1 is read the inputs, run the code, write the outputs, do it all over again as fast as you can. Okay, so let's write a little ladder logic. And ladder logic really comes from relay uh, schematic diagrams. Uh, ladder diagrams on, on relays actually have things like open contacts and normally closed contacts and coils and so forth. And so we're going to create what's called a ceiling circuit. And that's a, that's a typical circuit used for starting a motor or a pump or something like that. So I'm going to go ahead and grab from my favorites tray here. And by the way, this is all of the different operations that are, this is capable of doing. And then the favorites tray here, we can actually drag things over if we've got, you know, oftentimes used um, commands, we just stick them over here. If I wanted to add something new, a reset, I just stick it up there, and that's something I could use. In fact, I'll go use reset and set later. I'll put them both up there. Okay, so. Let's say we have our first normally open contact. If the input point that's assigned to that contact is turned on, wired to a push button, then it will actually pass power to, in this case, a coil, which will actually have a motor connected to it. So let's go ahead and call that one start. So it's a start push button, and this will be motor. So. Our logic right now, push the button, motor comes on. Let go of the button, motor turns off. That's not typically what we do with motors. Uh, usually you push start and you want it to run after you've released it. So we actually add what's called a parallel ceiling circuit. And I will go ahead and grab that, drop it down in here, and make a parallel contact that is also associated with the motor. So in other words, I push the button, the motor starts, this becomes true, then, and we can let go of the button, and after that, the next scan through of the PLC cycle, it'll actually stay running because the motor contact is now on. Make sense? It does, with one exception. Um, starting a motor without having any capability of stopping it is probably not a good idea. So let's add another little bit of logic in here and put a what's typically used as a normally closed contact for a stop button. So we push the button. Power can flow through the stop button without it being activated. And then uh, it turns on the motor. After that, the motor is on. If you hit the stop button, it turns off the motor and unseals the contact. So pretty simple logic. This is the way that we wired them up in the old days when we were using relays. And um, works pretty well. Let's go ahead and uh, assume that we've got a bunch of motors. And if we were to do that in logic, I can actually copy, copy the network. and paste it. Then we can do that a bunch of times. Control V. So we can go on and on and on and on and have lots of different pumps. Um, we'd have to assign different values to the start, stop, and motor buttons and so forth. But what, what happens in, when we do code like this and everything in organization block one is we, we suddenly get this gigantic block and trying to find a specific point to troubleshoot or, or see if the uh, push buttons are working or see if the motor's on or anything like that becomes rather difficult. A better way of doing that is to actually use a function, which is really a subroutine. Um, if I go ahead and add a new block and I create a function, and let's call that pump. See now it gives me a new template here. It shows up in my program blocks as a pump, and now I can actually write the code in here. Now I just copied and pasted my logic from before, so I should be able to do that again. Sure enough. 
So here's my start stop motor run. Now you've noticed that we've got these little squigglies underneath there. Um, these actually, that's because we have not assigned any of these symbols to actual addresses. Uh, which brings us to the point of this declaration table up above here. And this is one of the powerful features of a subroutine in that we can use the same code over and over again and we can pass parameters to it. And the idea behind a pass parameter subroutine is something that we can write, test, use, save, use in the future again. And one of the attributes that we need to have for a reusable or what we call portable code is we need to make sure that we have not used any absolute addresses in that code because absolute addresses means every time that block is called it's looking at the same address. So passing parameters actually allows me to go ahead and create past parameters so when I call the subroutine that's where it's going to get its signal from a start, stop, and motor. So you'll notice here in front of that we have a little hash mark and that just denotes that it's coming from our declaration table. And these are called booleans and you know, it's digital or bits, single uh, points. And then our output is an interesting one because in this code we're actually using the motor symbol as an output here but also as an input here. It's being read as to what its state is so we call that an in out. And I will go ahead and give that the motor name. Compile that, make sure everybody's happy. And let's go back to OB1. And I'm going to go control all and delete everything in there. And then insert in a new network. And now we're going to call our pump function. You'll see here our pump function has our three parameters here, and start, and stop, and motor. And what we need to do now is pass in some parameters into these guys. So let's say um, for our start, we're going to call it pump one start. Pump two. Oops, sorry. Pump one stop. And this one can just be pump one. I can go in here and define these tags now. I can do them individually, or a kind of a neat trick is that if I look at the top of a network and say, defined tag, it gives me all of the undefined tags that are in there. We can actually do them all at once. So what I want to do here before I do that is let's take a look at our actual PLC local modules. If I look at my input, for example, there he is. I'll see here I've got all these digital input points that are not assigned yet. If I go in here and assign them, the first one's going to be input 0.0. .0. That's the input address for the first byte in the first bit on the first module. So I'm going to say I 0.0. .0. I0.1 for the second input point, and then the pump remembers an output, so we call that a Q0.0, .0. and then I hit define. We notice down here, now we see actually the uh, definitions have shown up in, the, in our out input module, also in our output. And I should be able to go over here and look at my PLC, and Make a neat feature if I zoom in a little bit. I can actually see that on the front of the modules itself, it's got those definitions as well. So that's kind of neat. Anyway, so the power of this, this subroutine function is now that I can actually create a 
chunk of code, and this is pretty simple, and we would probably have a lot more added to this before it would be uh, valuable for us to save in a library, but we actually now have a subroutine that we can call multiple times. So if I want to have two pumps, I just call another pump block and I assign it different I.O. addresses and different symbols for the other pumps I.O. points. Make sense? Let's do something a little more fun here. Let's do a little bit of math. Um, let's say we're pumping into a, a, a tank. So we want to create a, another function to measure the actual volume of that tank. So I'm going to go ahead and add another function. We'll call it, how about volume? Now, admittedly, ladder logic is not the best language to, um, to use for mathematical functions, but um, in our case here, I, I want to demonstrate a point about um, portable code, so let's go ahead and use it anyway. So if we remember correctly from our math years, um, the volume of a tank is pi r squared times the height. So I'm going to go ahead and put in pi times r squared times height, just to remind myself. Um, it might make sense to do the R squared first, but that's okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually pass some parameters here, which will be the radius of the tank. And for a radius, we're going to actually use a real number rather than a Boolean. So if I hit R first, it's going to actually give me uh, all the different R values possible. Then I have a height. also real, and our output is going to be the volume. And R real. Okay, so let's do some math. Um, let's go ahead and look under math functions. I think there is a... We're going to form the square of the radius, and then we're going to, actually, I, what I should do is turn this, as, so I've got it so it's actually bumping out and going back away every time I click somewhere else. I'm going to go ahead and lock this uh, menu item over here. So I'm going to go square the radius, and then from that output, I'm going to multiply that by pi, and then multiply that by the height. So, in order to do that, I need to pass these results into the next block. So, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, first of all, I'll go ahead and put in the, we're going to do radius squared, and then I hit R, and it shows me the uh, pass parameter radius. And then this output is going to be just a temporary variable, so I'll call it temp, and define the tag. And it gives me a default of an MD. That's a double word. Um, M's are internal memory areas. So it's just going to give me the first unused uh, memory area. So I'll go ahead and use that. We'll pass the temp variable, the result of our radius squared to multiply it times pi, which, if memory serves, is 3.141. Five, nine, two, six, whatever. And once we have the result of that, we're going to pass that and multiply it times the height. So we can once again we can use this temp variable again since we're writing to it here and reading from it immediately. We don't care if we step on it over here and use the same one again. I can go MD. I'm sorry, temp. Pass temp into our multiply block. And then we're going to multiply that by height. And having done all that, our output is going to be volume. So we've got r squared times pi times height equals volume.
pilot. Go back to OB1. And now we can call our subroutine for volume. In the radius, actually, we would be plugging in probably be a constant. The height, you know, this might come from a uh, an ultrasonic sensor pointing down from the top, and then the volume output, which we can use to fill a uh, HMI screen or whatever it is we're going to do with that. Now, when we talk about portable code, this is just fine with one exception. If we go back into this block, this temp variable that we're using, although, you know, we're, we don't really care if uh, somebody else uses that since we're using it immediately right here. If you put a uh, function into a library and save it and then use it again in a future project, who's to tell if somebody else isn't already using this memory area for something more permanent and they want it not to be stepped on? So in other words, as soon as I call this block an existing code that has memory bytes, 0, 1, 2, or 3, because this double word has four bytes in it, um, we're going to be stepping on that. And that's going to cause a bug and we're going to have a problem. So the idea here is what we want to do is to creating portable code is not to use any absolute addresses. So I'm going to go ahead and look in this area here that they give us with a function called temp. And I'll just call this my uh, scratch flag. Just say scratch. Oops, sorry. Scratch. And we're going to make it real. So now I just say scratch, type an S there, and replace all of these MDs with my scratch flag. Okay, so now I compile that. And you can see here now we've used absolutely no static addresses that we could possibly step on somebody else's code with. So, save our project, go back to OB1. So what we've done here actually at this point is we've created blocks that we can actually use again so we can actually save them in a library. Now, there are a couple of different instances where we might want to actually make this a little bit more complicated so I can show off a little bit of, of the features of what we would call a function block. So let's go ahead and look at our function um, pump once again and add some more features to it. So once again, we have our network one with the ladder logic in it. Insert a new network, and let's say we wanted to add an elapsed time meter for our uh, for our motor. So we actually, after a certain amount of running hours, we wanted to service the motor. For example, I'm going to go ahead and pull down a normally open contact, and once again, we can use our motor contact since anytime this motor is running, that's going to be true, and I can pass that into a timer. And our timer, that we have several different timer types here, but one of one, one of which is called a time accumulator. A nice feature of the software is you can always hit F1 and it will actually give you a help file of, um, of how the actual timer works. We're going to go ahead and drag that in here. And what happens is when we call a function like this, it actually creates its own data block, and that data block is going to be used to store things like the elapsed time and so forth. Now, in a function, I only have one type of data block available to me, and I'm going to go ahead and select that one, and it created a block called DB1. DB1 is a timer block, obviously, and now I could actually give this a preset to say like after four, 444 hours. Um, we're going to turn on this timer. Now that's all fine and good and that will work great, um, but once again we've created a problem in that 
we've actually used something that's an absolute address. And this DB1 is an example of, of something, if, it, if we called this block now multiple times, it would step on itself and start using the same timer values for uh, accumulation of all the different motors we might be using. So to get around that, what we're going to do is we're going to use a function block. And a function block differs from a function only in that it has associated with it an instance data block. Similar to when we created the timer, it had an instance data block as well. So I'm going to create a function block, and we'll call this one pump with elapsed time. How about that? Go back and get my code here. I'll say Control A, Control C. That didn't work. Let's go back and get that again. Copy. Thank you. So now we actually we can define our um, pass parameters again. But also you'll notice up here that one thing that we if we look at the inside of the function we've got a temporary area is an area for constants and so forth. If we look at a function block, we've got one more, and that is called static. And the static area is where we actually can store data between calls. So every instance of the call of this block has its own data area. So what that gives us the capability of doing is I can right click on my timer and say change instance. Whereas before we just had single instance, now I can call it a multi-instance. And once I do that, you'll see up here in timer, it's actually going to be using the function blocks call for the data area for the timer. And once again, since all of our parameters in here are all past parameters, we don't have to worry about stepping on code. Compile that to make sure everything's happy. And what we've done is we've created a um, portable function block that we can actually use over and over again and pull it into future projects without worrying about actually stepping on somebody else's variables and so forth. Now, when we call a function block, we'll notice that it's going to pop up and say, it wants an instance data block to go along with it. This is that static data area. So we can call this pump1. We already have one pump1. OK. We'll call it pump underscore 1. How about that? So now we pass our parameters into our block. We, we have a uh, instance data block for this one. So now we could actually create another call and call it pump2. And what we've done now is we've actually created blocks and we've called them and we've actually been able to store data between calls. So this guy has its DB2, which includes all of its internal um, registers for that timer. And this DB, then pump2 has it all stored in this other data block. So no stepping on anybody else. If you pull this block into an existing project, it automatically checks to see what data blocks are available so it won't step on anything there. And actually, that gives us a nice uh, little clean way of saving and storing data for future use. One of the attributes of the TIA portal is, is its efficiency in programming. One of the things that I've found uh, attractive about Siemens over the years is this, this concept of structured programming and subroutines has been with us for many, many years. And, um, Something that uh, if I if I was doing a uh, a plant that had 20 
exactly duplicated machines in it or even somewhat close, um, we could actually write code for one of them and then call that code several times. And, and effectively what, what we're doing is leveraging our engineering efforts so that we can actually reuse code and not have to start every project like we're looking at uh, you know, reinventing the wheel. Okay, so having said all those things, let me take a look at, um, we, we've mentioned libraries a couple times. Let me show you over here in the corner where we find libraries. And I can actually click on that. And it will actually give me a, a list of all the libraries. Now, Siemens populates um, the software when you install it with a bunch of different libraries of functions that they've written that we can use in the future. Um, or we can create our own library. Now, this would typically, if I, if I just create it here, it would actually be on my local drive. Um, you can create this on a server and so forth, which would make sense if you have multiple people working on a project. So once I've created a library, I can open it up. And there are several different features that have recently come out with, um, the, with the libraries that we can talk about more in more depth at uh, in a workshop or in the class, but um, for us today, I'm just going to actually create what's called a master copy. So in other words, if I wanted to save my work in a library, I've now got my volume block over here. If I want to save my uh, elapsed time block. Now, code is, is very nice to be able to save in libraries and so forth, but oftentimes we have a lot of configuration and so forth that we're going to be using again in the future. So things like, I can save this whole PLC in a library. And what that has done is it's now given me a copy of that PLC with all the code, the configuration, all the hardware and so forth. So if we want to start with a template that we use over and over again, I've just done that. And, and all the work that we've done so far today is now saved in that template. And we can pull, if this was a starting point for a future project, we pull that in and all that work that we've done before we reuse again. Okay. I've got a question here about um, copy protection. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into that and show that. And that's in the actual properties of a block. And if I look, for example, in my FB1 and go to properties, it gives me this pump with elapsed time properties block. And if I look under protection, it gives me a couple of different options. And some of these are, um, I mean, we can actually do a standard protection, which, and I don't have this saved right now, so I can't go actually en enable it, but um, there are two different variants here. The know-how protection actually is a password protected um, com compilation of this block so that once it's been protected, you can actually see the call of the block in your OB1, for example, and you can see the past parameters passing in, whether they're on or off. And then internally, the miracle happens, but you just can't open it up and, and see how the uh, code was written. Um, to take it to another level, there's actually a binding feature, which actually is kind of a neat thing. What that does is it actually binds the function to the serial number of either a CPU that it's downloaded in for the first time, or a memory card that's in that CPU. So in other words, you can copy this into the memory card, and then if there was ever a replacement of the PLC in the future, they pull out the memory card, stick it in a new PLC, and it would run. However, if they took the contents of that memory card and copied onto a couple of dozen other memory cards trying to duplicate your efforts, um, they would not run because that other memory card would not have the same serial number internally and it would not run the code. So there's a couple of different features there for copy protection and intellectual property protection, which is a big concern these days. I do have another question about why are there three ports on the CPU we chose? Let's go take a look at that. Zoom back out a bit. Get out of here. Um, there's actually three ports on this, and, and they're actually on the um, the processor itself is a is 
it's a 1515 that actually has two IP addresses. So in other words, 1515-2 PN, which means PROPINET. So it has two actual IP addresses. However, there are three ports here because these two are actually connected together. That's an internal switch. And that gives us some topology options for doing things like daisy chaining or leaving an open port to plug in a uh, programmer or something along those lines. Um, one of the advantages of having these multiple IP addresses, it actually allows us to segregate subnets and we can actually have an IO su subnet that's actually kind of isolated and off by itself and then this one might be, the other um, IP address may be connected to a plant-wide HMI system or SCADA system and so forth. Some of the other neat features of, uh, if we look up above here when we're in the hardware configuration page, I'm looking at the device view tab. If I look at the network view, it'll actually show me all the different devices in our project and how they're networked. Right now, I don't have any other um, devices in the network, but I could actually add something. And since I've cl clicked on network view, it gives me all the different things that I could add. And we can add a distributed I.O. node, for example. And there's various different um, form factor I.O. points that we can actually add into this project. Um, the two latest um, entries to the Siemens line are the SP and the MP versions. So those of you familiar with the, the 200S, which was kind of a slice-based I.O., and then the 200M, which was the actual S7300-based um, I.O., this is kind of along the same form factors. Um, the t SP is a higher density version of the, uh, the 200S, and then the MP is actually um, is using the 1500 I.O. as remote I.O. And we have PROFINET or PROFIBUS options. I'll go ahead and grab a standard, ST standard, and pull it over there. And I.O. nodes, um, it's a master-slave arrangement, so that it, since it doesn't have a master assigned to it yet, it says not assigned. And I can fix that by just dragging over my PROFINET cable and putting it on here, and you'll see here now it pops up saying that PLC1 is the master of that I.O. device. And where I was going with this is actually the, the, the third tab up above here is called Topology View. And that actually shows us all the ports. And, and the question came in about why were there three ports. Well, now we can actually, in the topology view, we can actually show the physical connections that are on the machine that are actually uh, how the thing is wired, in other words. So I can actually determine which port goes to which port here. And what will happen now is that gives me a diagnostic capability. If we ever lose a connection, it can actually take us down to the port level and tell us which port was disconnected. Um, one of the advantages of PROFINET is that actually it uses the Ethernet standard TCP IP uh, conventions and so forth, including layer one stuff, which means that I can actually do ring topology, which is kind of nice. So if I do that double connection here, it's actually created a ring. And what Siemens has done with the TIA portal is that it, it actually is going out and checking, are these compatible devices with a ring architecture? And if they are, if I double click on my, profi, my uh, 1515 again, I can go here and look in underneath advanced options for the, um, we'll see media redundancy. And you'll see that it's automatically assigned the 1515 to be a ring manager. And ring managers just kind of uh, orchestrate any communication pathways that if, if we're actually communicating through this wire between the two and that gets cut, it will actually start talking to the other wire and going the other direction. Um, if we look at the I.O. module, it's got an advanced options also. It's media redundancy saying, or saying that it's a client. So this is automatically configured ring architecture and redundancy for us. Um, that's actually quite a powerful tool. This works with HMIs, it works with drives, it works with the uh, Siemens PLCs, and um, 
pretty much any of the Siemens um, configuration nodes that actually have two ports on them, including all their managed switches lines and so forth, and we can take this out on fiber and do all kinds of wild stuff. Okay. One more question I've got here is web server. And I um, mentioned a little bit about web server earlier. There is a um, built-in web server on most of the intelligent devices these days. So in other words, if I go back over to my PLC, you go into its configuration, there is a web server here. And actually what this does is it allows me to just activate the web server by clicking a, a box there. Um, we can make it security access. There's also some user management stuff we can do here. So in other words, if I wanted to put in a new um, user, I can actually tell it what access I'm going to give him and so forth. So in other words, can he just look at the diagnostics? Can he only read things? Can he um, write stuff and um, write or delete you know, uh, the log files internally and all that kind of stuff? So here we can actually determine what kind of level access that we give to an individual login. And the web page actually has a built into it um, several different pages, including all the diagnostic buffers and so forth that are inside of the PLC. Uh, diagnostic buffers are a nice um, method to look for things like uh, those nasty intermittent faults because the log actually timestamps every event that happened in the PLC, and that's automatic. It, it does that by itself, and so. If you've got a PLC that went down in the middle of the night and then powered back up again um, and your production was down, you can go in there and look in that log and it will tell you what time it happened, what time it stopped, and why it stopped, and when it started back up again, and all those kinds of things. That appears to be all the questions we've got for today, and that's pretty much uh, what we wanted to cover. Uh, once again, what did we do today? We actually configured an, uh, a PLC, um, an S7-1500. So we started out by adding a new device. Um, we went into it and we programmed a couple of uh, different blocks and showed the differences between um, uh, kind of spaghetti code in and, um, and subroutines and, and what we call um, portable code and um, did a couple of examples on how to do functions and function blocks and a little bit of math, passed some parameters and um, saved them in a library and set some um, IP protection schemes. Um, Hope you found that interesting. I appreciate your time today. And uh, once again, you can always come back to my E&M, um, the 866 number gets you access to E&M and um, allows you to talk to our uh, tech support guys or uh, inside sales or whoever you need to speak with. Tell you with me. Yes, I am. Thank you, Bill. Um, and I just wanted to mention um, that we this a recording of this webinar will be available by Monday afternoon, uh, more than likely this afternoon, but definitely by Monday afternoon if you want to review it or share it with any colleagues. Um, so thank you, Bill, and thank you everyone for um, joining us. If you think of any questions after the webinar, feel free to email us um, at the email that Bill has on the screen. And um, everyone have a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.